Our Father in heaven, as we look at your word today, we pray, Father, that your spirit would be with us, that he would open our eyes to behold wondrous things out of your word. Father, as we're looking at the book of John here, we pray that we would come to see Christ more. Father, all of us, without exception, see far too little of Christ. He is the adoration of angels. He is the ones who the prophets long to look into, to know more about who this Messiah was to come. Abraham saw Jesus' day and rejoiced. He's the delight, Jesus is the delight of saints right now in glory. Oh, Father, I pray that you'd help us to see Christ. Remove distractions, remove the, the blinding work of Satan. Um, Father, may we see our Savior. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The purpose of the book of John is given in John chapter 20, verse 31. This is a good thing for you to just keep in mind as we're going through this book. These things are written, John writes, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, and that by, by believing, you may have life in his name. The whole purpose of the book of John is to both create belief in Jesus Christ, that he's the Christ, the Son of God, and also to sustain belief that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and to grow that faith. And in our passage today, Jesus has not yet begun his public ministry. What we've seen so far is the prologue of John. It's basically just a, a, a condensed snapshot of the entirety of the book. We looked at that for the first 18 verses. At this point here, Jesus has not begun his public ministry. Now, we read later on that the events of this passage here, it takes place after Jesus has been baptized and also after he has been uh, led on into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He's been successful in the wilderness and angels tended to him for many days, we read in, in the other Gospels. But the other Gospels say that immediately after that, or after that rather, that he went up to Galilee and began his public ministry. Now, this is where John is so helpful. John is the last gospel written, and he is writing from a different perspective than the other gospels, and he's filling in some spaces that the other gospels leave out. So before, or in between, the wilderness temptation, and between him beginning his ministry in Galilee, you have John 1 through 4. The first four chapters of John fit in that window right there. And, and that's what we're looking at today, the beginning of that section. Now, the passage here is all about the testimony of John the Baptist. We've already seen a little bit about John the Baptist in verses 6 and 7. We read there that the Apostle John says, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. That's John the Baptist. He came as a witness, to bear witness to the light, who is Jesus Christ. Now, the word for witness there is martyria. He came to be a martyria of the light, Jesus Christ. Now look at our passage. Look at the beginning of it. Verse 19. And this is the testimony of John. The Greek word there is exactly the same word as, uh, as was used in verse 6. It's the martyria of John. Now look at the very end of our passage. Verse 34. And I have seen and have borne witness. There's the word martureo. It's the same root word. So here what you have is this is bookended with, this is the testimony of John the Baptist. Jesus has not been revealed yet, and John is going to give strong witness, strong testimony of who Jesus Christ is. In verse 8, it tells us that John is not the light, but he came to bear witness to the light. So the way you can think of this is, Jesus is the light of the world. He's coming into the world. Because of our sin, we're living in darkness. We're, we're blinded to the light. And John is like the moon. So he's not the light, but he simply reflects the light and points forward to the light. That's what the moon does. John is brightly proclaiming who Jesus Christ is. He's the first witness, the first testimony on the scene, and he's saying, look to Jesus. Look to him. Center yourself upon him. Now, we, we may not think of this, but we need testimony to believe almost anything. Your knowledge about almost anything is undergirded by the testimony of other people. Uh, for instance, how do you know that the Battle of Gettysburg happened? 
Well, we, we weren't there, but we know it because other people have borne witness. There's been abundant testimony, so we have confidence that it actually happened. Uh, how do we know that someone's guilty of a crime? It's by eyewitness testimony or by forensic testimony, but there's testimony that confirms something. Uh, even things like, how do you know anything about geology, or about astronomy, or about electricity, or about plumbing, or about cooking, or cleaning? Well, the way we know it is through the testimony of other people. We don't call it that. We say other people taught us, or other people showed us how to do something, but it was their testimony that showed us uh, how to do that. To know who Christ is, God has given us abundant testimony of Jesus in his word. And the most prominent witness leading up to Christ's ministry is John the Baptist himself. The following verses here from verses 19 through 34, this is John's testimony that he gives of Jesus meant to show forth the glory of Jesus Christ. Meant to help you see uh, how awesome it is that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that you would see him, that you'd see the glories of the sun as he's reflecting the, the radiance of the sun. And then you come to love Christ more. Or, if you're here and you're not a believer, then you come to see Christ and believe in him for the first time. So this passage is divided up, John's testimony is divided up in two parts. The first part is John's humility as a witness. And then the second part is John's explicit witness about Christ. So let's look at those one at a time. John's humility and then John's actual testimony. So see first the glory of Christ in John the Baptist's humility. So John's ministry, John the Baptist's ministry, uh, it was located by the Jordan River. We read that these events here took place that are happening here uh, in verse 28. Just look down at that passage. It took place in Bethany across the Jordan. This isn't the Bethany by Jerusalem that Lazarus and Mary and Martha lived in. This is another Bethany on the other side, the eastern side of the Jordan, which is in the wilderness. That's where John, that's where John lived. And his message while he was out there was, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's what we read about in Matthew 2.2. 2. And as he gave this message, uh, many people came out to him. He was baptizing them in the Jordan River. And the reason why he was baptizing these people was for the forgiveness of sins. He's telling them, you need to turn from your sin. You need to turn from your wicked ways. You need to turn from doing life your own way. You need to turn to God and you need to be baptized. You need to profess your repentance through being baptized. Now, many people were going out to John, and the religious leaders took notice of what was happening. In verse 19, we read that the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem not to hear what John's saying, but to interrogate him. They don't like what John is doing here, and they're demanding answers. Now, these aren't just your average Joes that are being sent out to John the Baptist to, to inquire of him. These are the religious leaders of the day. You have the priests. Those are the individuals from the line of Aaron, and they're responsible for the temple worship. Then you also have the Levites. Uh, the priests were from the tribe of Levi, so they're kind of a, a small portion of the tribe of Levi. The Levites, the tribe of Levi, they have many different tasks, but they're the religious leaders of the day as well. And what their question is, is, who are you? We see that in verse 19. Now, John's response here, it is filled with humility. Uh, he's not defensive. He's not arrogant in his answer at all. There's incredible humility in what John says. So who are you, John? The, the first thing he says in verse 20 is, I'm not the Christ. I'm not the Christ. The Christ, that's just a translation of the Hebrew word Mashiach, Messiah. The Messiah is the long-awaited son of David who is going to reign on the throne and of the increase of his government and a peace, there will be no end. That's the one that all the Jews are looking forward to. And they haven't had a, a, a prophet here for 400 years. They know that John is a prophet. And many people are thinking, could John perhaps be the Messiah? John, John is certainly aware of this here. He's not even asked directly, are you the Messiah? He just volunteers this information. He says, I am not the Christ. Now, you, would, you might think, maybe John might be able to take the interest, the curiosity of some of his followers and take it to his own advantage. He could say, 
look at the huge crowd that God is bringing to me. Uh, so what if they think that I'm the Messiah? Um, they're hearing the message. They're hearing the message of repentance. They're, they're being baptized. Um, God's using their misunderstanding for good. Uh, I, I might lose a lot of followers if I clarify that I'm not the Christ. But that's not important to John. He says very plainly, I am not the Christ. In fact, look how plainly he says it. In verse 20, he says, he confessed and did not deny, but confessed. That's a way of saying, make no mistaking about it, I am absolutely, positively not the Christ. Well, verse 21, they ask, are you Elijah? Now, why would they ask if he is Elijah? Elijah was a prophet from about 700 years earlier in the Old Testament. Why would they think that he's Elijah? In Malachi 4, 5 through 6, why don't you just keep your finger here in John, turn back to Malachi 4, 5 through 6. I want you to see a, a prophecy there. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament, and here's what Malachi writes. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. So God promised that before the great and awesome day of the Lord that he would send Elijah. Now, no doubt, some people were thinking, maybe, maybe John actually is Elijah. Both of them were dressed very similarly. They both wore uh, garments of hair. They had a, a leather rope around their belt. They both did ministry in the wilderness. Uh, they both were powerful prophets of God. So is he Elijah? Now, Elijah, if you remember, Elijah never died. He never died. He's one of the, the few saints that never died. Uh, he and Enoch. He was carried up by the chariot of fire up into heaven. Uh, so he never died. So many of the Jews, they thought Elijah will physically come back to earth and he'll minister once again. They thought maybe that's what Malachi means by this prophecy here. That was their understanding. Well, uh, Jesus, in Matthew 11, 13 through 14, he actually says that John is the Elijah to come. So, so what do we make of this? Jesus says John is the Elijah to come. John says, I am not Elijah. What do we make of this? Are these contradicting uh, one another? I don't think so. I think John is responding to their misunderstanding of Malachi's prophecy. He's not literally Elijah. He's not Elijah come back from heaven on earth. But Jesus is right. He is that Elijah that Malachi prophesied. He did come in the spirit and the power of Elijah before the day of the Lord. Matthew Henry says, John the Baptist was the Elijah that God had promised, not the Elijah that they had foolishly dreamed of. But John says, in great humility, he says, I'm not Elijah. Then they ask him, verse 21, he says, are you the prophet? Now the prophet here was prophesied by uh, by Moses in Deuteronomy 18. Moses said that from the people of Israel that God would raise up another prophet like himself. He would speak the very words of God and he would be a greater prophet than Moses. And here uh, 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 John the Baptist says, no, I'm not the prophet. He could have said, I am a prophet, but he doesn't even clarify that. He just says, I'm not the prophet. Well, verse 22, these denials are not enough for them. They say, well, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? Now, John could have said a lot of things. He could have said, well, I'm one that God has blessed with a great ministry. Uh, many people are repenting, being baptized, confessing their sin. They're being prepared for the Messiah. Jesus says of John the Baptist in Matthew 11, he says, there is no one born of woman that's greater than John. He could have said that, but he doesn't say that either. Look at his humility. He says, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. So here he's quoting from Isaiah 40, verse 3, which there it speaks of this coming glory of the Lord. And a voice cries out to make straight the way of the Lord. Um, there's hills, there's mountains, there's valleys. It's rough terrain. And this is speaking of our own sins. Uh, John came to preach a message of repentance. Uh, 
to repent means to change your mind. You're thinking one way about God. You're thinking one way about sin. You're thinking one way about living life your own way. To repent means change your mind, and that re results in a change of action. Uh, that's what John was doing. Make straight the way of the Lord. And this is a reminder. A people fit for the Lord are not a proud people that, have, that think they have their act all together. A people fit for the Lord are a humble and contrite people. And John says, what I am or who I am, I'm just a voice. I'm just a voice crying out in the wilderness. In fact, uh, specifically, I'm just a herald. The glory of the Lord is coming, and I'm simply saying, make the way straight for this one who's coming. You, you think of a herald. A herald is his entire job, his entire uh, position is all centered on someone else. If you have a town crier that's saying, um, the king is coming, the king is coming. Everything he's doing is all centered on the king. And John says, that's all I am. I'm just a herald. Well, next, look at his humility regarding his baptism. We see this in verses 24 through 28. So now, now the focus turns from who is he to what he's been doing, which is baptizing. Baptism, of course, is where someone is immersed in water. And John had been doing this as a symbol for the forgiveness of sins. So look at verse 25. They say, then why are you baptizing if you're neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet. So why are you doing this, John? Now, the Jews, it's not that they didn't know the concept of baptism. We read of some Jews, they practiced uh, baptism for those that were uh, proselytes, those that were Greek converts to Judaism. They become part of the Jewish people, they formerly were, were Gentiles, and then they would be baptized. Uh, but what's interesting is they would never be baptized by someone else. They would baptize themselves. So here you have John. He's baptizing other people. It's not just a couple random people here or there, but there's all of Judea, all of Jerusalem, Matthew says, that's coming out to John the Baptist. So there's thousands of people being baptized. And John the Baptist is saying, uh, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So the, the Pharisees here who have sent uh, the, the Levites and the priests, they're saying, what gives you the authority to do this? How can you baptize? How can you talk about this coming kingdom of heaven? How do you have the authority to do that? Now, what they're doing is they're just throwing John the Baptist's humility right into his face. They say, if you're not the Christ, you're not Elijah, you're not the prophet, how do you have the authority to do this? John has just been very humble. He said, I'm not those people. And now they just throw it in his face and said, well, you don't have the authority to baptize. I think it would be very easy for us, if we were in John the Baptist's shoes, to get defensive. Say, I'm not going to give you an answer. Look, God's blessing my ministry here. I don't have to answer you. But look what John the Baptist says. It's amazing. Verse 26, I baptized with water, but among you stands one who you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. So why does John baptize? He baptizes to prepare the way for one far greater than himself. That's why he baptizes. There's a great one coming. There's the Messiah coming. And that's why he's doing it. And look how low John stoops here. He says, I am not worthy to untie the strap of his sandals. T to take off someone's sandals, um, that was the task of slaves, the task of servants. So here John the Baptist is saying, in regards to this great one who's coming, I'm not even worthy to be called a slave or a servant. I'm lower than that compared to him. You know, it's almost like you have these men sent from the Pharisees here, and they don't care about John the Baptist's ministry. They just want to basically put John the Baptist in his place. Why are you doing what you're doing? You don't have the authority to do that. And it's almost like someone's yelling at the moon saying, who do you think you are? What gives you the right to shine at night? And the moon doesn't take offense at all. It just shines all the more brightly to those that came to question him. Beloved, see how John's humility exalts Christ. This isn't John saying, woe is me, I'm worthless, I'm no good. All his humility is all oriented around Christ. He's a voice crying out in the wilderness about who? It's about Jesus. He's not worthy to untie this person's sandals, but who is it? That's Jesus. 
John the Baptist is oriented around Jesus, and when he compares himself with Jesus, he says, he's far greater than me. It's my joy to proclaim about him. And I'm not even, I'm less than a slave compared to Jesus. And, and beloved, doesn't John's humility give him credibility as well as a witness? Pride blinds us. Pride makes us deceivers. How often do you say something that's not true, you twist the truth because of your pride? But a humble person who loves the truth will speak the truth plainly. We speak out of the overflow of our heart. So if there's pride, if there's pride or arrogance in our heart, there's going to be deception coming out of our lips. But here you have a man who's being uh, put under the magnifying glass by these religious leaders. And he responds with perfect, consistent humility. Saying, it doesn't matter how God's blessed me. It doesn't matter the gifts that God's given me. It doesn't matter the position that God's put me in life. It's all about Jesus. Do you think you can trust the testimony of someone like that? Absolutely. Absolutely. So see the glory of Christ in John the Baptist's humility. Now, see the glory of Christ in John the Baptist's testimony of Christ. Verse 29, we see that the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him. And John gives three amazing declarations of who Christ is. Now remember, Jesus has not been revealed to Israel. All that's happened so far is Jesus has been, uh, Jesus has been baptized and he has been faithful in the wilderness. But he's done no miracles. Uh, there's been no teachings that he's done. He's a nobody right now. John the Baptist now sees him coming out of uh, back from the wilderness to him and listen to this amazing testimony that John the Baptist gives about Christ. The first is this. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The first word that John says is, Behold. Behold. It's not a word that we use today, but it means see, look, pay attention. And he says, Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away sin. He takes away sin. That is the most fundamental problem that all of us have, is our own sin. It's our own disobedience before God. Uh, it's very common today for us to think of um, those that are privileged and those that are not privileged. And we, and we pit different categories against one another. The rich and the poor, men and women, uh, those that are white, those that are from a minority background. Um, even today we have those who are straight and those who are LGBT. And we pit these groups against one another. Now, of course, there can be wrongs done to other people. But the greatest problem that we have is not the, what other people do to us. The greatest problem by far that we have is our own sin against God. The wages of sin is death. The human race on account of sin has been cursed. The world and everything in it has been cursed. We are separated from God because of our sin. We have a guilty conscience because of our sin. We die because of our sin, and ultimately, we will perish in the lake of fire that burns forever under the holy and just wrath of God because of our sin. In the Old Testament, God provided a sacrificial system where the blood of lambs and bulls and goats were offered up for sins. These animals were killed, the blood was applied to the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies where the presence of God dwelt. And with those sacrifices in the Old Testament system, God passed over the iniquities or the sins of his people because of those sacrifices. But here's the important point. Could those sacrifices take away sin? Could they truly take away the guilt, the stain of that disobedience, that guilt that comes from sin? It couldn't. It was impossible. Hebrews 10.4. Hebrews 10.4 says this. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. But beloved, praise God, Jesus Christ is the Lamb who takes away sin. His sacrifice is sufficient to truly take away the sin that we have. In the Old Testament, there was a, a, the need for the sacrificial lamb to be pure and spotless, for there to be no blemish at all in that lamb. Well, Jesus, Peter tells us in 1 Peter 1, that Jesus was that pure and spotless lamb. There's no iniquity, there's no defect, there's no sin, no stain at all in Jesus Christ. Despite that, Jesus died in the place of sinners on the cross. 
And there on the cross, he bore our sin. The chastisement that was justly upon us was placed upon Jesus. And he took our sin and he, take that, he took that sin, he sank into death and then into the tomb and he bore it completely. And because Jesus bore the sin of all who repent and believe in him, our sin is blotted out once and forever. The guilt that we have because of sin is taken away once and for all. The punishment that was upon us is completely gone. So that we still sin as believers. We still sin. We still wrestle with sin. But that punishment and that guilt, that stain that's upon us, that's completely gone. We have been forgiven of our sin. We have been justified. But there's even greater news than this. There's even greater news than the fact that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There's a progression here throughout redemptive history. You have Isaac in Genesis 22. God tell, tells Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your son, your only son. So they go up on the mountain. And there, uh, God provides a ram caught in the thicket. Uh, so that this individual, this one person, uh, God passes over that one person. And then with the Passover lamb, God provided a lamb who was slaughtered and the blood was applied to the doorposts of each household. And God covered the guilt of each household. And then you have the Day of Atonement in Leviticus 17. There God provided a goat who was slaughtered and the blood was applied to the mercy seat. And God covered the guilt and the stain of the whole nation. But what does it say in verse 29? But in Christ, the Lamb of God, he is the one who takes away the sin of the world. It's not just the sin of Israel, but it's the sin of the whole world. The sacrifice is for all peoples and all nations, all who repent of their sin and trust in Christ. And beloved, this is what the angels love to sing about in heaven. In Revelation 5, this is what it says, the four living creatures and the 24 elders sing of the Lamb. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they shall reign on the earth. Well, you know what this means? If Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, it means that he is the one who covers every and any kind of sin. Your sin is not greater than the blood of Jesus. Your sin is not greater than the blood of Jesus. His blood purges the, purges the worst of stains that sin brings in our lives. The sin that you look back on your life and you look, at, you look back on it with shame and with grief. Jesus' blood covers that sin if you turn to him in living faith. Jesus' blood covers the sin of murderers, of drunkards, of thieves, of the self-righteous, of adulterers, of liars, of cowards, and of the envious. His blood cleanses any and all who turn to him in true faith. William Cooper was a man who wrote a couple hundred years ago, and he wrote, there is a fountain filled with blood. And this is what his song says. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath that flood lose what? Lose all of their guilty stains. Lose all their guilty stains. Lose all their guilty stains. And sinners plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. But pay attention. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Look at the next declaration that, Jesus, that John the Baptist makes of Jesus. He says, He's the Spirit-filled Messiah who alone gives the Holy Spirit to others. Look at verse 32. And John bore witness and said, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove and remained on him. Well, what's John referring to here? He's referring to the baptism of Jesus Christ. We read from the other Gospels that when John baptized Jesus and then brought him out of the water, that it says the heavens were parted. And then it says that there is the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus in the form of a dove. And then there's a voice from heaven that said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. 
John saw that all happen. He heard that all happen. And now look what he says. He's, he's making, in his mind, he's making a connection of what the Old Testament had promised. Here he says, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove. And then what does he say? And it remained on him. It remained on him. That's significant. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit worked with the people of God uh, by coming upon uh, one of the people of God for a particular purpose, for a particular season of time, and then it would, it would leave that person. But here with Jesus, John says, I saw the Holy Spirit descend and remain upon him. And John the Baptist is probably thinking, I know the prophecies about the Christ, about the Messiah. The Spirit wasn't just going to come upon him and then leave him. The Spirit's going to come upon him and it's going to fill him completely and remain with him. Listen to Isaiah 11, 1 through 2. It says, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Shall rest upon him. Beloved, Jesus walked in the fullness of, of the Spirit during his entire time on earth. He always walked by the Spirit, walked in obedience to the Spirit. That enabled him to walk in obedience to God and also to do mighty miracles. Sometimes we have a hard time wrestling with what does it mean for Jesus to be truly God, to be truly man? Does that mean that when he's, when he's walking in obedience to God, that it wasn't difficult for him? Because he's truly God after all. Well, the Bible tells us that uh, the way that he walked in obedience to his father was in his, in his humanity resting upon the Spirit. That's how he walked in obedience, and that's also how he was able to do as many mighty miracles as well. Keep your finger here. Go to John, uh, Acts 10, Acts 10, 38. This is Peter preaching here, and this is what he says. He says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Jesus was able to do good and also to do his miracles because he was anointed from God with the Holy Spirit. He walked in the Holy Spirit just as you and I do, but he was completely submissive to the Holy Spirit. Well, look at verse 33. What does the Spirit-filled Messiah, what will he do? Look at verse 33. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So here, John had received revelation from God before he baptized Jesus about what this person was going to be like who would be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would descend upon him. What does this mean? Well, John had, God had given this revelation to Jesus. And he says... The one on whom the Spirit descends and remains, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. John had heard this. John had baptized Jesus. John saw the, the Holy Spirit descend upon him like a dove. And now he's saying for everyone to hear, this one here, this one from Nazareth, this one baptizes with the Holy Spirit. I only baptize with water as a symbol of forgiveness of sins but he gives the Holy Spirit to all who trust in him. And, and brothers and sisters, what we need is we need the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. If the Spirit of God, if we have the Holy Spirit, we have God. The Holy Spirit is the one who gives life as well. If we want to walk in godliness and walk in holiness and have joy in our lives, we can't do it on our own. We need the Holy Spirit. Well, Jesus gives the Holy Spirit. If we, want to have, if we want to know that we're a son of God, if we want to know that we're a daughter of God, the way we know that is through the testimony of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. And John is saying, the only one who gives the Holy Spirit is Jesus Christ. He's the one who has the Holy Spirit upon him, resting upon him, and he's the one who gives the Holy Spirit to others. And we see this at Pentecost. Jesus has ascended into heaven. Forty days later, he sends the Spirit upon his followers. And ever since Pentecost, Every believer in Jesus Christ has the Holy Spirit. We've been given it because of Christ. Look at the last thing that John proclaims. 
Verse 34. He saves the best for last here, the most powerful declaration for last. He says, And I have seen and borne witness that this is the Son of God. We see how boldly he makes this proclamation. I have seen and borne witness. He is the Son of God. This is what John had heard at the baptism. The voice from heaven had said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I'm well pleased. And this is also what this whole book is meant for us to come to believe. That Jesus is not just a good man. He's not just a good teacher. He is the Son of God. And therefore, Jesus is worthy of all of our worship. How could it be any other way? The one who provides forgiveness of sin, the Lamb of God, how could it be anyone else other than the Son of God? The one on whom the Holy Spirit descends and rests, and the one who gives the Holy Spirit to all of his followers, how could that be anyone else other than the Son of God? The one that we worship, brothers and sisters, is the Son of God, which means he is one with God, the same divine nature as the Father. He's eternally God. He's worthy of all worship, all praise, all obedience. He's the one that we believe in. So let me ask you this. Do you receive the testimony of John? Do you receive the testimony of John that he gives? The testimony that he gives, we shouldn't think that it's just for the Jews 2,000 years ago. The testimony that John gives is just as true today as it was 2,000 years ago. Well, we can respond in one of two ways. We can either respond with the pride of the Pharisees and the Levites and the priests. Um, they had an interest in religious things. They spent their time with religious things. But they had no interest in Jesus. They were concerned about their own kingdom, and they were not concerned at all about the kingdom of God. They saw John, the forerunner of Christ, as a threat, and therefore they saw Christ as a threat, as we'll come and see. They viewed John's message of repentance as something to be questioned, not something to be obeyed. They refused to see whom John was pointing. So we could have the pride of the Levites and the priests. On the other hand, we could have the humility of John. We have the humility of John. John was not taken up with the blessings that God had given him. God had blessed him greatly, but that wasn't his great joy. John realized that Christ is so great that compared with him that he viewed himself as less than a slave. Um, as we'll come to read in a little bit, John says, he must increase and I must decrease. John saw himself as an undeserving sinner before Christ. And John's joy was to look to, to trust in, and to point to Jesus Christ. So, starkly put, it's one of those two choices. We can either have the pride of the Pharisees, the pride of the Levites and the priests, or we can have the humility of John. It's really one or the other. John declared, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Look to the Lamb of God. That's what John's call is for us. Look to the Lamb of God. But proud people don't look. Proud people refuse to look to the Lamb of God. Humble people, on the other hand, they do. Because they realize their own need and they realize John's testimony is true. I need to look to Christ. So may we humble ourselves, humble ourselves afresh, receive John's testimony afresh, and may we see the glory of Christ. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for Jesus that he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Think of the, the first blessing that David mentions in Psalm 103 where he says, Bless the Lord of my soul and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord of my soul and forget not all of his benefits. And the first one he mentions is who forgives all your iniquity. Father, I pray that we would come to rejoice in the fact that because we've trusted in Christ that our sins are completely forgiven. And I pray, Father, that if there's anyone here today that they are not trusting in Jesus Christ, I pray that they would look to the Lamb of God. They would look to Him. They would trust in Him. And they would be saved. 
We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.